Hey there, Dave here. Before getting into the episode, I have some cool people that I would like to say thank you to. People like the Top 3 Podcast Crew, Chris Nelson, Zol Geek, Colby Moyer, Eric Guess, Rick Firestone, and Jill. These lovely people have all gone to patreon.com slash Jackson and supported the tube and the podcasts within. You can be just like them by heading to patreon.com slash Jackson. As little as $2 per month will get you some treats like voting rights on what comes up on episodes of a top three podcast and Tales from the Backlog, bonus episodes and bonus content, and much more. Once again, that's patreon.com slash Jackson. Check it out. That'd be very cool of you, and you would be my hero. All right, on to the show. Everybody, my name is Dave Jackson, and this is Tales from the Backlog, early morning edition, where each week I'm joined by a guest to talk about a game we played. My guests today are friends of the show, hosts of the Good, the Bad, and the Backlog podcast. Uh, we have the humble custodian, Adam. Hi. <laughs> so sorry, I just got a text message. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Yeah, pleasure to be here. <laughs> Good to have you, man. And we're also joined by the escaped test subject, Kieran. Indeed, I am here. I'm I'm <laughs> glad to be here. It's good to have oh you guys. God. We have triangulated the most inconvenient time zones to make this podcast episode <laughs> happen. So it's it's great to have yeah. you guys on the show. It's a pleasure to be here, but yeah. I expect that there will be a lot of like um over to you in the studio, Nancy, and then three second delay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It might happen. We'll figure that out. Um, Today, we're going to be talking about Prey Mooncrash, which is a first-person shooter, immersive sim, roguelike, a lot of genres going on here, developed by Arcane Studios Austin and published by Bethesda in 2018. This was DLC for the main game Prey, which was released in 2017 and was the topic of last week's episode on Tales from the Backlog. Uh, But this DLC is meaty enough that it deserves its own episode. Uh, So I'm going to kick it to you guys for some little elevator pitches. How would you pitch Prey uh, to people who, or Prey Mooncrash, to people who don't know what this is? You want to go first, Adam? No, you've got more notes than me. (laughs) God damn it. I thought thought we were uh, doing an elevator pitch for just ordinary bog standard Prey. But uh, I'm sure I can, I can change that. Um, I would say it's imagine a weird amalgamation of Half Life, Dead Space, Bioshock, and chuck in a little bit of Total Recall, um, and uh, <laughs> and then you've got you've got Prey Moon Crash, which nice. to me sounds like uh, quite a delicious a delicious mix. Yeah, that is uh, that's quite the concoction there. Yeah. I've got one. I've got one. <laughs> okay. All right. What do you got? Okay. It's going to be, it is The Matrix meets Groundhog Day. <laughs> That's it. In space. <laughs> <laughs> In space. Yeah. Don't forget that part. I wrote down yeah. uh, just a continuation of last week's elevator pitch. Um, a modern immersive sim roguelike. In space. There we go. Put, put a nice load of reverb on the space. Yeah. <laughs> that is really uh, good that is one <laughs> editing step too many perhaps but we'll see <laughs> <laughs> I agree. one thing about this episode today we're going to be talking about prey moon crash like i said the, just the dlc uh and i spent like two hours and 45 minutes talking with nick and will from friday night gamecast last week about prey uh, so we're not going to explain how Prey works in this episode today. If you don't know how Prey works, you should play Prey first before playing this anyway. But go listen to that episode, or better idea, go listen to the episode of about Prey on the Good, the Bad, and the Backlog 
uh, because I really thought that was an excellent episode. Uh, so uh-huh. on that note, I'm going to turn it over to you guys uh, to explain to people uh, what is the good, the bad, and the backlog. I'll jump in here and take the reins. Um, uh, also, Prey episode is episode number 67, and thank you for the compliment. That is very nice. The Good, the Bad, and the Backlog is a podcast where every episode we basically play a game that we have on our backlog. So, it's either myself or Kieran one of us has to have not finished the game before or not played the game before. So, that's the criteria. We can play a game that one of us has finished as long as the other person hasn't and, you know, whatever. We just discuss what we think about it. And the the whole motivation of the the podcast was that we would, um, it was conceived during the pandemic. And the idea was that we could just knock off all the games that we've been leaving on our shelf for ages and finally get it sorted out and done but also have some fun talking to a friend about a game like kind of like a book club situation i guess sound about right kieran that sounds about right yeah although i would add that it probably hasn't worked very well i think our backlogs probably (laughs) got bigger (laughs) since we started so uh at this rate we will be doing this podcast until we drop dead hopefully Hopefully that's soon (laughs) <laughs> i was just about to say the opposite because i think the good the bad and the backlog is a really good time um very similar premise to this show uh you guys don't do the strict like spoiler break um all the time uh that i do but uh in episodes where it like demands that you guys also do that too um so yeah backlog uh what are we calling it backlog boys backlog babes kind of uh, similar stuff yeah. going on <laughs> Um, backlog bitches there we go backlog bitches and (laughs) one of the things i really like about your show is uh i i've talked i talked about this with nick and will too last week um is just like you know you find a podcast from time to time where the hosts just have like the best chemistry together and every episode is like just like hanging out with two like really good friends talking about some games. And that's how I feel uh, listening to your show. And I think you guys are like just crushing it. So a uh, big recommendation oh. for everyone to check out the good, the bad and the backlog. Oh, and funny story. Uh, when I was naming this podcast, um, I was thinking about backlog related podcast names. And that legitimately was something I thought about. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> that's too long i'm not going to name my podcast that. <laughs> <laughs> what idiots would use that <laughs> all right <laughs> now i chose a another podcast name that's it's not short tales from the backlogs not that much shorter um my original <laughs> podcast name did you guys know this was baby got backlog that, oh, that was one of ours as well we had was that on the list oh, yeah we had a huge list <laughs> That was one of my original names, and uh, I recorded like five episodes with that name, and then I discovered it was taken. And I went back and yeah. re-edit, like edited in a new intro for the show <laughs> on those first like four or five episodes. Uh, so there we go. <laughs> we nearly did the exact same thing. We had that on our short list, and then we had the backlog boys because we're just thinking of like puns to do with like music and film and stuff. Um, yeah. And then I think even in the first couple of episodes, we used the phrase baby got backlog. And thankfully, we just didn't run with it because <laughs> cringe now. <laughs> <laughs> I still think oh, yeah. it's funny, but I don't really think it matches the vibe of this show super well. So, um, no. yeah, yeah, luckily, no. luckily, it was taken. Yeah. yeah, probably for the best. I don't come to think of it. I don't know if the good, the bad and the backlog is strictly like a vibe. As, as far as names names go for our show. I don't know. Well, we I was thinking... Know. I was thinking one of you could be the good, the other is the bad, and then, of course, there's the backlog. Yeah. Yeah. I think the concept was that we would be weighing up the good of uh-huh. the games that we're talking about and then the bad, and then, obviously, the backlog is where we're playing the games from. But right. now that I think about it, it's so... Yeah, maybe we should change our name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's Don't just change your name. Like I think it's good. I think it's good. <laughs> Spoiler policy for the Prey Moon Crash episode today is uh, this game has a story, but the story is much less of a uh, surprise, I would say, than the story in Prey. Uh, so we're going to like set up the story, but even in the spoiler section, I don't think I'm going to really focus too much on the story here. 
We may talk about the the character side quests, uh, but uh, the spoiler section here is going to be just talking about our how we beat the game, basically, because this is uh, one of those games where you have to do a, a perfect loop. Uh, so we're going to talk about that in the spoiler section, some character side quests, uh, maybe a few story moments, but yeah, spoiler policy. There we go. Great. So let's get into talking about the game and uh, talking about our personal histories with this. Uh, now, I know both of you guys played Prey, uh, obviously, because you did a podcast episode a couple months ago uh, at the time of recording. But what made you want to play Moon Crash? That's the question here. Well, I think you asked us. <laughs> uh, was <laughs> it, was to play it just Moon me? Crash? <laughs> <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I mean, I had sort of heard about Moon Crash before. Like I stumbled upon a video on YouTube about it. And it was one of those things where it was like really sort of, um, oh, Prey Moon Crash is the best game that you've never heard of or, or the best DLC in the world, yeah. blah, blah, blah. So, like some like overly dramatic uh, subject line or something. And I was like, oh, okay, that sounds cool. And then at the time <laughs> I hadn't played Prey. So, I was like, you know, whatever, maybe I'll play it one day. And then when we mm -hmm. did Prey, I was like, ah, oh, okay, Moon Crash is apparently really good, but I don't have any desire to play it right now because I've just done Prey. Um but yeah, I mean, if you hadn't asked us to do it, I probably wouldn't have played it for another okay. year or so. Yeah. I'm not a DLC person, I don't think. Yeah. That's kind of what happened with me too. But I'll, I'll let Kieran uh, explain. Kieran, is it the same thing for you or were you planning on playing it earlier? Yep, yep, yep. yep. It's much the same. In fact, I don't think I'd even heard of it until Adam mentioned that you fancied doing an episode on it. So uh, <laughs> there may well be a alternate reality where i haven't played this game or haven't even heard of it um and that would be a shame but uh much like adam i'm not really much of a dlc person and if i hear that a dlc is a, a roguelike add-on um yeah that might have put me off it's not something i typically lean towards um but thinking about it it's not really something i've really delved into anyway so this is sort of like it might not be, but this is sort of like my first roguelike as well. So that's kind of intriguing. Ooh. But uh, but yeah, it's, it's good to have actually tried it out and got quite a good playtime out of it. Like you see some DLCs that last for a few hours are just add on like small add ons. But this is a this mm. is a proper beefy chunk of game. It is. Yeah, this is its own game for sure, which is why it's getting its own episode here. Uh, same thing yeah. you guys said. It, it was the exact same for me. Like... So I played Prey for the first time, maybe in 2020, something like that. And I loved it. Like the uh, as we're recording, the episode about Prey is not out yet, but I think it's an incredible game. And I was the exact same. I was like, I love this, but roguelike DLC? No, I, I don't like roguelikes are not close to the top of my favorite genres. So I just kind of ignored it. And then... I, I saw lots of YouTubers uh, also talking about this game, but specifically when Deathloop came out and people were reviewing Deathloop and they were saying like, yeah, Deathloop's fine, but you know, Moon Crash is better. And so like kind of a negative comparison for Deathloop there. And then when I played Deathloop and I had some issues with it, I think Deathloop's a pretty good game, but I had some issues with it. I started to think like all those people said Moon Crash is what you actually want from Deathloop. So wanted to go back and play it. And yeah, I know. I remember we, we I mean, we've been talking about how to get you guys on Tales from the Backlog. Like basically the whole time Tales from the Backlog has been happening. We've just been like looking for a game <laughs> to play and a time to match up and all of that. Uh, and I remember like posing prey and you guys said you're going to do your own episode. Uh, so then it was like, well, why not moon crash? That game's good too. Yeah. 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 I'm glad. I'm like, glad it's happened. Yeah. I have a question though. So is dark souls and bloodborne not roguelikes? Uh, no, because you don't like you die and have to start back at the checkpoint, but you don't lose your stuff and like, kind of start the whole game over again from zero okay why do yeah, i have I in my you, head you that lose i thought your, that they were roguelike you lose all your progress as in like experience that you've gathered on that run but all yeah. the areas that you've unlocked and access to them still remains accessible to you yeah That's yeah so okay. it's just a game just a game with checkpoints uh basically 
Uh, there is a roguelike mod for Dark Souls that turns it into like a real roguelike, which I am interested in playing now that uh, now that I have a PC that can handle running f- games in 3D. Uh, but <laughs> I di- we we digress. So how are we talking about Dark Souls in a prey episode? People are always like <laughs> Dave talks about Dark Souls too much. Here we are. That's my uh, fault. I brought it up, but um, I guess that means that Prey Moon Crash <laughs> technically is my first roguelike as well. Then. Wow. Okay. So no, nothing like Hades or anything like that for you guys. No, I've got that on my no. shelf. Still haven't played it. It's on the backlog. <laughs> <laughs> the backlog grows continually. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I was a little bit hesitant to get into this because I don't normally love uh, roguelikes, but I like Prey so much. Uh, and then again, like I liked Deathloop, but I wanted more from it. So I was like, okay, it's time. Time to get into Moon Crash. You guys mentioned that this game's a little bit beefy. Um, it's bigger than, you know, the average DLC. My playthrough took me 16 hours uh, to get through the final loop. Do you guys know how long mm. it took you? Yes, yep. I do. I'll go first. <laughs> okay, go ahead. You go first. <laughs> um, I think it took me 11 to 12 hours. So I thought that would be sort of like a typical amount of time that it would take someone to get through. Um, and then yeah. apparently not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty quick. I checked how long to beat and uh, that is kind of a, the standard thing. I think like 12 hours seems pretty average. I, I took a lot longer than that. I, I think I was in it for about uh, 30 hours was my Jeez. final play time. Can't really explain why, but you know, okay. <laughs> that is very similar to my playtime of the actual main game of Prey. So that's, I thought that, quite, that was quite interesting that I've got like, yeah, basically another game, another game's worth out of the DLC somehow. He's just really bad at games. <laughs> really <laughs> bad. <laughs> Could be, it should be really bad. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to get into some kind of opening thoughts about how we feel about it before we get into the breakdown. I think that this, uh, as DLC, number one, feels kind of like a final exam for Prey. Uh, I would not recommend someone play this before playing the main game because they just don't teach you all of the kind of mechanical interactions that the game is built on. They don't tutorialize how a glue gun works, for example, in this, whereas in the main game, they do a very good tutorialization for how that stuff works. So it kind of feels like a final exam. Uh, It requires you to learn uh, how everything works inside and out um, in this station that this takes place in. Um, And you'll need to like master this to beat it. And this was, like I said before, this was what I wanted from Deathloop. Deathloop holds your hand to completing the perfect loop. It basically teaches you how. And all you have to do is follow the markers. Uh, in this game, you have to figure it out. Um, you will learn throughout like going through the game. But when it comes down to completing the final loop, it is all you figuring out and adjusting to situations. And I think that they pulled this off incredibly. And after playing this, it makes me wonder... In my death loop episode, I said I thought they bit off more than they could chew. And then they simplified it to get the game into a working playable state. And I feel like this was the game. This is the thing. What you want from Deathloop, this is it. It's really good. That is interesting. I agree. So are you, are you saying that <laughs> this is better than Deathloop then? I, Deathloop is more fun to play, like kinetically more fun to move and jump and slide mm. around and shoot. It's more fun in Deathloop for sure. But that roguelike promise of figuring out how to complete the perfect loop, it's Moon Crash. Moon Crash did it. Yeah, that's interesting because I don't really know how Deathloop works um, and I just assumed that this was very similar. But um, what I kind of liked about Moon Crash is how it sort of forces you to change your play style from what you would have been doing in Prey or certainly what I was doing in Mm -hmm. main game Prey because you haven't got a time limit majority of the time so you can sort of take your time search every nook and cranny um and just gather endless amounts of stuff and (laughs) if you do that in moon crash you're gonna find that your corruption level is gonna go up the enemies Uh are gonna get significantly more difficult 
and you're going to you're going to struggle to to do a round to escape certainly if you're trying to escape with everyone um that took me a while to to compute i have to say um at first i didn't even know there was a corruption level <laughs> i was just going along <laughs> like typical really stealthy kind of slow gathering everything um and then realizing that everything is getting more difficult and i'm definitely not going to escape uh so it was kind of nice because by making you change your playstyle to a more fast-paced um, playstyle, it is like playing a different game, and I think they've done it really well by by, by making us do that. Uh, my initial impressions were: this is a really neat concept. How cool! And then when I played the first character, which is the um, what do you call it? The experiment dude, volunteer. Yeah, the volunteer. Yeah, so I played as the volunteer and I was like, okay, um, this is so easy. What the hell? Because <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that there's no difficulty selection unless I'm crazy. And I thought, I need to up the difficulty. This is way too easy. I don't know what the hell's going on here. Or have I accidentally started the game in super easy mode because that was a piece of cake? Um, <laughs> thankfully... It evolves, and it's not just that. the The first level is literally just like baby steps teach you how to play it. Um, this is what Moon Crash is all about. Situation. So, um, I sort of thought, okay, this is going to be a really quick game. <laughs> I was in love with the concept, though, especially with the different characters, because I was really intrigued and excited to see who they would be um, and how they would play. And I really like how restrictive it is compared to the regular game. Yeah, so let's take a little music break. We'll listen to some Sweet Prey music. When we come back, we will get into those characters and what's actually going on in the story. So in Moon Crash, uh, you play as a hacker named Peter, uh, employed by a company called Chasma, uh, and Peter is on a satellite orbiting the moon with eyes trained on this uh, Pythias moon facility, uh, owned by Transtar, which was the company from uh, Prey, the main game. Uh, Pythias moon base has recently stopped transmitting, and so uh, what you're doing is you're running simulations of Pythias to figure out what happened. So you have a character sitting in a high-tech space room and you're running simulations of what is going on on the base. And in these simulations, you can control five characters who uh, lived and worked on Pythias. Uh, So you have... uh, Oh, no, I should not have uh, tried to pronounce... uh, Andreas Alekna, uh, who is a volunteer, um, volunteer in air quotes, aka an experimental test subject... Um, Riley Yu, who is the director of Pythias Station, Vijay Bhatia, who is the chief of security, Claire Witten, who's a custodian, and Joan Winslow, an engineer. Uh, so those are your five characters. And Adam, you mentioned this uh, before, but those characters are kind of restrictive to different play styles. Uh, so in Prey, the main game, I had my play style that I used. Uh, I used lots of Typhon powers and I used uh, a couple of guns, um, and that was my play style. And in this game, the characters all have like set ability trees that they can move through. You cannot like choose how you want to play these characters. It, it kind of forces you to play. You'll have a couple characters that may overlap with how you played the main game, but there's going to be a couple that don't. And so it forces you to really explore all of the systems in the game that maybe you didn't really get into in the main game. And I thought this was like really, really fun uh, to learn more things about Prey, even though I played the main game for 25 hours or so. Oh, I totally agree. Like, I think Prey Moon Crash's best asset is the fact that it does allow you to really, uh, you know, use the arsenal that you're given for each character. So like in the main game... I had so many abilities to choose from that I sort of had to pick my play style and I was sort of 
almost like a jack of all trades. I could basically do everything I needed to to progress. And the yeah. beauty of Moon Crash is that you have certain characters that don't have a hacking ability or who don't have, um, you know, a repair ability. So there are certain obstacles that will present itself to one character that they just can't get past. So yeah, it's up to another character to use that ability to get past that. And then um, I don't know if you've mentioned it yet, but I love that this simulation, this world that you are playing in, each character, like what what you choose to do with each character will um, affect the next character. So, yeah. you can hide a mug in a, a closet or something and the next character can go and grab it. So, yeah. you know, it's super cool. It was similar for me because on my first playthrough through play, uh, Prey, I didn't do any Typhon powers. I did the... Uh-huh. I think that was a, that was an achievement for doing something using only like certain types of powers. Yeah. Um, and I thought to myself, like if I had time, I would do a second playthrough and I'd venture out and try some of the Typhon powers. Never did that. So it, it is nice to have the opportunity to actually try out these, these gameplay mechanics, which I essentially just never would have touched otherwise, um, which again leads to a totally different play style. Yeah. So yeah, it, it's very cool. Very cool. Yeah, so like for example, uh, Andreas, uh, the volunteer, it's your first character that you can control. Uh, they use Typhon powers, and that's basically it. And each character gets like between like two and five abilities, uh, and then a couple of like passive skill tree things that you can unlock too. Um, but it, so it's it's the characters are very simple with the tool sets that they give you. Like uh, this volunteer basically just uses like offensive typhon powers and that's their skill set and then you have um the uh the engineer who can repair stuff and they have a couple of other powers but like the fact that they can repair things and no one else can means that they uh, have this like really important ability and in order to like finish the game like you said adam you're going to need to take that engineer go repair something and then like uh go back to that place with another character um in order to uh like complete the loop so what i mean by completing the loop is that peter your character the hacker uh, is told that if uh peter can uncover what happened at pythias by completing these simulation objectives um that peter can go home basically and the main objective is to escape from the uh station with all five characters uh in one loop so that's what you're doing and this is the same kind of concept as death loop because and i feel like more people are familiar with death loop where you have to kill all of the visionaries in one loop in order to win uh, in this one you have to escape with five characters in one loop and so in order to do that you're gonna need to like go repair something with the engineer and then take a different character back to that place because they couldn't get through that place because a door was broken. Um, and so you have to kind of plan out how you're going to execute this perfect loop. And the game gives you other objectives to do too. So you will learn uh, all of these things. It, it's It may sound overwhelming, but I didn't really feel overwhelmed by this when I was playing. I don't know how you guys felt. It actually made me excited because like... yeah. I, um, I, as soon as I've realized one particular character can't escape until a computer is hacked and something else is repaired, then I was like, got it. You need to have a character with a hacking skill to repair, like to hack the computer first. Then you need somebody to repair the other thing. And I'm like, sweet, I'm going to plan it out, go these two characters, then that character can escape that way. So I was already from the beginning sort of planning it out, um, what I was going to do, uh, and and the best way to get everybody out all at once. But the problem was at that point, I hadn't unlocked the character who had the hacking skill yet. So, right. it's kind of like um, what I do love as well is that you can't just straight from the get go escape immediately. Like you're going to fail. And each time you fail, you still gain the knowledge of having explored the base and pinpointed exactly where you need to take these characters to use their other abilities and, and what you're missing to to you know progress the story or uh, progress your best loop or or best run of the simulation 
yeah he's spot on i had those same occasions where you'd turn up to do something only to find out that you don't have the character or your your character doesn't have the the right ability to be able to hack something or to repair something but then by finding this thing that you need to do you kind of know well i obviously need to use this character first um and that sort of tells me that there is almost a proper order or i thought there was going to be a proper order to do everything um but a bit of it is is sort of free flow um but it it did catch me off guard quite a few times um sometimes to to my annoyance where i would like be all prepared to do something only to find out that because of the random nature of the loops that something had changed and um <laughs> i like had to change my plan uh but once i sort of realized that i was able to bring the neuromods and the powers and stuff to from one character to the next and utilize the uh the little robot the little handy robot container dude yeah um that was like a game changer completely uh it was fucking motorbike just being quiet for a sec um <laughs> uh, yeah once i once i was using that and just bringing helpful items from one playthrough or one character to the next uh, it was it was just it made things so much easier um mm-hmm. and I, I foolishly did not use that until like quite quite a bit late later than i should have <laughs> That's what I was going to say is I literally didn't know you could do that until like my final run. So, I've been doing everything like just ignoring all the items and leaving them there for the other characters to pick up. I never once used the mule until my last <laughs> run. <laughs> yeah. I was similar with the um, Typhon Gates because I was was like trying to constantly just divert the moon shark away from the gate to try and open it like all the time um mm-hmm. until i had my characters become like full of typhon mods so that the gates wouldn't open anyway and i was just confused like what the fuck am i supposed to be doing here <laughs> uh and then i had to look online to find you could use the disruptor stun gun and uh like it's it all makes sense it's all so logical now that you think about it and it's uh it's so kind of common sense really but it took me longer than i care to say <laughs> to work that one out yeah, I, I'm going to be honest. I, don't, I have no idea what you guys are talking about when you say a mule. So apparently I played the entire game without <gasps> that. Oh <laughs> my God. No. Do you not remember when you got the... um the? So you get two little summons. You get one that's a mimic and you get one that is like an operator, a little robot That's right. Thing. Yeah, the operator. Yeah. 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 You can literally put items on the operator so it will just hold it and have its own inventory. And then in between right. characters, you know, they can access that. Oh, like, okay. Yeah. yeah. I So, yeah. I didn't expect that to be a possibility, so I never used that because <laughs> uh, I was like, I don't have too many items. I don't need you to carry my shit. Uh, I didn't know that other characters could access that. That's pretty uh, wild. It was so good because you yeah. could chuck in <laughs> just like food, med packs, those control modules, anything, and it just stopped you from needing to go hunting around when you were playing yeah. with a different character it was yeah it was really okay. helpful so maybe that's why my playthrough took me a little bit longer than adam's uh because i <laughs> doesn't was... explain why mine took me double the length no. <laughs> <of both. laughs> <laughs> true but that kind of puzzle that you're working out of how to have the characters help each other get out of the uh the base uh, yeah. in addition to getting themselves out that is like the bread and butter of the game and that is like uh just incredible stuff and they really they do a good job of teaching you about the station through all the side quests that you have to do but when it comes down to doing that final loop it's all you it's all the knowledge that you've accumulated uh, about it and that's a really really good feeling yeah yeah true. you can make it super easy though like y- you absolutely if you're can. smart <laughs> <laughs> if you're if you're smart that's a big if there adam well, I mean, so I don't want to tell you exactly how I did my thing just yet, but I'll, yeah. all I'm going to say <laughs> is that um, each run that you do, you unlock points in the simulation that you can use to yeah. buy items for the next character's uh, attempt at their run or whatever. So, if you just play through and and not buy anything for a while, it's really easy to just 
either stock up on neuromods to max out your character's abilities eventually towards the end or um, buy everything that you know you're going to need like a disruptor gun. I think I bought one of those for every single character because I knew that I had to get through those Typhon gates and yeah. do it quickly and I didn't want to fight anything. So, my main strategy was run past every enemy, um, use the stun gun on the uh, the Typhon gates, just keep running, don't even bother fighting anything and just get to the end. So, uh yeah, I was very non-combative. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's kind of how I approached the final couple of runs too. And that's how I approached like the ending a uh, couple hours in the main game too. I didn't fight shit in the last couple hours of the main game. I just ran past everything. Um, and there are some abilities that help you do that too. Uh, but I definitely did do that. Um, and you brought up that kind of between run stuff. So let's just get into talking about the roguelike elements of this game. Uh, so each character or each character's version of the simulation you get one life basically uh, one chance to escape um, and if you die that character's try is uh, gone and you have to reset the entire loop uh, to try them again and the way that you finish the game again is get all five characters out in one loop um, and i mentioned before this is very similar to what death loop is but this game actually makes you figure it out for yourself. Um, and I, again, I think that Deathloop was trying to do this. Like, I think this is what they wanted from Deathloop, but Deathloop's just a little bit more complicated than this. Uh, and I think that they maybe ran into issues with, uh, like programming that, or, uh, they, maybe they play tested it and people were like, this is, it's too complicated. I don't know. Adam, you played Deathloop, right? No. <laughs> no? Okay. <laughs> I I saw it and I was like, yeah, I ain't getting that. Like, okay. <laughs> I have a knee-jerk reaction to um, games that get 10 out of 10 masterpiece uh, oh, yeah. reviews. So, like, we just recently covered God of War 2018 and that yeah. got 10 out of 10 masterpiece reviews. And that's exactly why it took me four years to get around to it. Mm -hmm. So, I'll play Deathloop eventually, but... Um, okay. Not for a while. Yeah. And I, I have an episode with Morgan from uh, Intergalactic Pinecone about that. And we talk about how it's it's good. It's not a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, though. Um, yeah. Because of those things I've been mentioning in this episode here. Uh, so anyway, um, while you're controlling the characters uh, and bef kind of before you're attempting the final loop, you're not going to be able to do the final loop and get all the people out right from the beginning. You have stuff you need to do, too. Uh, basically, you have some side quests. Each character has one uh, kind of story quest, which fills in the story of what happened on Pythias and then also teaches you about their character and just kind of makes you move through the station so you can like acquaint yourself with the character's abilities and then the different parts of the station. Uh, and all of that knowledge is going to go into that final loop. Um, and then when you die, uh, which you will because like Adam said, it gets difficult. Uh, maybe it starts out easy, but it gets pretty hard. Um, in between runs, uh, you're earning these sim points while you're going through uh, for basically everything you do. You pick up an item, you kill an enemy, you find a dead crew member, you uh, complete a kind of, they're called Chasma bounties, but they're little bonus objectives. Um, if you escape, Everything you do, you get these sim points and then you spend them on upgrades and uh, items in between runs. Um, and you have to find the fabrication plans uh, in order to make items. Like, say you want to make a disruptor stun gun and take it with you on the next run. You have to find that fabrication plan out in the world and then you can make it, uh, pay for it, buy it and take it with you on the next run. Um there were a couple items that I just never found fabrication plans for that would have been very useful, like the stun gun. I never found the plan for it. Weird. Damn. Yeah. I had like more fabrication plans than I knew what to do with. And <laughs> there were of like different qualities as well. There was like elite ones and advanced ones and stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it took me a long time to get a fabricated plan for a glue gun. So... 
I almost never used the glue gun. I don't think I used it once throughout the entire playthrough of Mooncrash. And that was an absolutely vital piece of equipment for the main game. So, yeah. I was surprised and actually kind of happy because I felt like I wasn't forced to use it. So, mm -hmm. I found ways around, you know, situations where you would typically think, oh, yeah, that's a glue gun situation. I'm like, nah, fuck the glue gun. I don't need the glue gun. <laughs> I can solve this another way. Yeah. I I felt like that until I had a run where... I think the crew quarters, well, no, Pythias Labs was basically all on fire, and <laughs> like I had to basically use the clue gun to to clear the fire, make it safe to travel through. Uh, there's another mm -hmm. time where like a whole area was um, uh, electrocuted, and you just could not walk through it without getting damaged. So, using the glue gun was quite crucial in that. But uh, I think. Most of the fabrication plans I found, I th like the only one that I know that I didn't get was the glue uh, grenade thing that they added. Uh -huh. I didn't think I ever got one for that, but then I never really used that very much. Um, Interesting. But yeah, like Adam, I had absolutely shit tons of these uh, fabrication <laughs> plans, just like standard versions, basic versions and elite versions yeah. of various bits and bobs. Yeah, I had a lot of them. Uh, but I there in like for most items that I needed or wanted to take with me, I found the fabrication plans. Um, but there were a couple where I was like, it'd be really fucking nice to have that stun gun. And I just never found the plan. And it makes me <laughs> wonder if they're placed randomly or I it's possible I just missed one when I was in an important room or something. I don't know. But I mean, I beat the oh. game. It's not like I couldn't do it. Yeah. I think I think it's random. I I think that everything is randomly decided on the loop. It's mm -hmm. all just like shuffled uh, RNG style. Because there's yeah. definitely times when I knew I had collected something from this place, and I go to get it again, thinking I'm smart. I know where this is, only to be called an idiot when there's nothing there, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and regretting not giving my character that in the menu. Also, I love that every time that motorbike goes past, it sounds like you're ripping ass. <laughs> <laughs> it's a fucking bike. Oh, I actually messaged you. I'm like, did you just fart? <laughs> um, Still going. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, jeez. I just I lost my train of thought. Good, uh, good noise reduction on this audio file. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. All farts and motorbike noises are farts and fart like noises stay in the recording. <laughs> It's just this they have to have a shot fucking, every time the motorbike goes past. <laughs> just doing rings of this place. Like, come on. <laughs> but yeah, Dave, did you know that you could use the EMP grenade instead of the actual disruptor gun? So, yeah, if you wanted to get I, through. I, I figured that out, but it took me quite a long time uh, to figure those out. So, like, yeah. even though I never found that stun gun, I did have ways to uh, to get past those gates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's like the, the situation with the electrified floor that Kieran just brought up. I never used the glue gun for that because I always had the... Um, what's that, like, jetpack thing? What's that called? Oh, the uh, propulsion mm -hmm. system. Propulsion. Art yeah. Artax propulsion. Yeah. That was... Yeah very integral to every single one of my characters i made sure that every single one of them had a propulsion thing and yeah. i would use it like religiously so electrified floors weren't a problem because there was always enough space to like get to the next safe platform um so yeah absolutely that's how i and got they, that. they added in the tap uh jump twice in a point of direction yeah. and you could like fling forward really far using the jetpack that was great yeah, yeah. That was so cool. I love that. Was that in the main game? I don't remember. No, no, no. That was a new edition. Ah, so good. There, yeah, there are a couple of new things that they put in this. A um, couple of new, or well, like that, and then a couple of new items uh, that are really helpful, like that glue grenade and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, I never used it. <laughs> <laughs> I never used it either. Um, yeah. It's kind of like you, like, I played... I probably played 10 hours of this game without finding a glue gun or the fabrication plan. And so glue just kind of like faded into the background uh, yeah. for this one. I'm kind of glad it did. Like it was so common to use it in the main game. I know I'm repeating myself, but like it's a great idea that they utilized really well in the main game, but yeah. I just don't need it. I didn't need it in this. No, I didn't. I didn't ever... 
uh, find myself like needing it too. There were like in the main game, I used it a lot to like build platforms and climb up walls and stuff. And in Moon Crash, it's a lot more horizontal. I'll say yeah. there are a couple times where like elevators are not powered or something. So I could have used it, but I, you know, I found my way through it. It's fine. Yeah. Um, good, a uh, good chance to get into talking about Pythias, uh, the setting of this game, because you're going to become intimately familiar with this. Like you will memorize the layout. You will memorize the quickest way from route a to B, um, et cetera. So it's made up of these four main areas. Uh, the main it's called the crater area, which is like the hub. And then there's three spokes, Moonworks, Pythias Labs, and the crew annex. And um, you're going to, in the course of doing these character side quests and stuff like that, you're going to cross from these places all the time. You're going to go crew annex to Moonworks to crew annex again, et cetera, all the time. Yes, very, very yes. familiar. Oh, I know that place like the back of my hand. And although that's not necessarily true because in my later runs, I was just fucking around and still found places that I hadn't come across before. And I was like, oh, shit. There's this part where it's just this weird little pit full of, I'm pretty sure, like briefcases or something. And they're all mimics. And I didn't come across that (laughs) until my final run. Do you know what I'm talking about? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Kind of. Is it in in Moonworks? Uh, yeah, yeah, wait, yeah, it's Moonworks, it's, um, if you keep going up and then it's sort of towards the, um, uh, monorail station or whatever it is, there's, like, you uh-huh. can go through a window and there's just this place yeah, full of yeah, briefcases. Yeah. Okay. That's pretty good. I'm glad I'm <laughs> not imagining that. I think there's, like, a note or an email that might say about that place, just a slight hint. Yeah. Uh, could be wrong. There's definitely something about a briefcase, but yeah, even, anyway. like, on my playthrough, I was finding little rooms that I hadn't got to before. Just wait for this Do that again. fart to finish. <laughs> just like. God, did you eat beans? What the fuck? <laughs> oh, so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, like, even on my playthrough, getting to the end, I was still finding rooms that I hadn't been to or, or like, little hidden shafts that you could go through to get to something else. Um, there's, like, one of the rooms in the upper area of Moonworks... Is it Moonworks? Yeah, Moonworks. Um, where there was like a locked door and just on my last, last playthrough, I took the, um, sorry, a, a broken door. So I took the engineer up there who otherwise would have like no real purpose going up there just to unlock mm-hmm. this door. It wasn't anything exciting. It wasn't really worth the time in the loading screen, <laughs> but I did it anyway because I wanted to find out what was in the room. Uh, there was just like yeah. various places like that that he's like, ah, oh, what if uh-huh. I go here with the hacker and see if there's a door that I might have missed? I just like yeah. I just liked the excitement of uh, unveiling what was inside. You could have used the um the president person to turn into a coffee cup and slid through the hole in the door. Mm-hmm. Oh, I see. I just didn't even think about that. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> Damn it. It there's definitely like there's some places in each area that are like the critical rooms that you're going to go to a million times. And then yeah. there is a bunch of like other rooms that they might have like a small purpose and a side quest or they might just be bonus, you know, rooms because they, they did kind of flesh out these areas to feel uh, like real spaces, um, just like the main game. So mm-hmm you are rewarded for poking around still. It's just a little bit less than the main game um, because you are, you're not going to be able to keep all the items you find, etc. cetera. Um, but it is still fun to poke around um, even though some of those rooms are strictly optional, I would say. Yeah. I would yeah. assume that there are areas where um, potentially valuable items might spawn in, fuck, might spawn in randomly like those, yeah. um, hourglass things to to extend the yeah corruption time time. yeah i use those a lot and i was very smart even if i do say (laughs) so myself about how i use those (laughs) little pat on the back there yeah Yeah. look i'm just gonna say it i was a fucking genius all right i I finished this game in 11 12 hours you suck it is been established yeah (laughs) yeah you guys took forever i was like sitting on the beach enjoying my martini and you guys are still (laughs) stuck on the moon um, I was having a good time on the moon. I'd spend another 30 <laughs> hours on there. <laughs> yeah. Well, fine. Uh, Go off and sit on the moon then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
you mentioned the uh, corruption. And so I'll just kind of explain that for a second. Um, the more time you spend in the loop, the longer your loops are going, uh, this corruption meter rises and it will hit levels of corruption. So level one, things are very easy. Um, you spend some time, it'll get to level two. Enemies get a little bit harder. Tougher enemies will start spawning all the way up to level five. And if you get to level five, the simulation crashes, basically, and you lose. Um, the good thing, though, is that uh, level level one to two goes by pretty quickly. Level two to three is a little bit slower. Three to four is even slower. Uh, so it's not like you're... It's not a linear thing between like levels one to five. So I hit level five one time, but it was because I wanted to see what would happen. Otherwise that didn't happen to me. Yeah, I definitely hit level five as well. I tried to get through without using any of those hourglasses um, and I just couldn't do it. So I think I I was at a point where I was like, I'm just going to go through and try and get as many points as I can because I know this run isn't going to succeed. Um, But there's also those super annoying uh, environmental hazards that pop up around yeah. like two and three. And I was just like, Ugh. so I tried my best to make sure that the corruption level never got over level one. I was like level one the whole time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Another thing with the corruption level is that whenever it goes up a level, all the monsters in every area respawn. So if you've cleared out, yeah. an area, it's full up again. Yeah. And also combined with the environmental hazards that you occasionally get you can also get one of the loop um malfunctions or whatever that speeds up corruption time and i had this two or three times where the corruption (laughs) time would just go well fast so i'd be like trying to find those delay loop times and craft the bloody things and still i'd be getting to level five uh yeah yeah that that probably added to my play time just pure pure rage oh (laughs) Yeah, that does sound rough. Um, I I was like you, Adam, for a long time. I was trying to keep corruption at level one. And then I just kind of had to make peace with the fact that level two is not so bad. And level three, <laughs> I can just run past everything. So yeah. eventually I gave that up. Um, and on my final loop, I think it was on level four when I got the last character out. So I... I did eventually just kind of go with God as far as the corruption goes. Uh, but I did use those hourglasses for sure. Yeah, I definitely used them. Uh, like I got the the fabrication plan for it. So I was just like spending sim points to get hourglasses. And that got me through. I don't think towards the end I got over level one at all. I was like, this is easy. This is a piece of cake. <laughs> just- this is pro gamer tips with Adam. Yeah. <laughs> Just save up all your sim points, um, accept that you are not going to finish the, the game, you know, first try, um, kill as many enemies as you can, get as many sim points as you can, bank them up so that when you're actually going to be serious, you know, pay for the hourglasses, pay for the neuromods, max out your character abilities, and then just go ham, like buy what you need and have fun. Yeah, I forgot Absolutely. to mention before you can use those... Uh- you can use those sim points to buy neuromods to unlock new abilities for your characters, uh, similar to uh, the main game, using neuromods to get through your skill tree. Um, but in this game, you can find neuromods um, in specific places. They respawn in the same kind of offices and stuff, uh, important locations. Uh, so if you know that, you can like run over and grab them. Uh, but you can also buy them in between runs. They're not cheap, but they're also not like prohibitively expensive. You can usually, if you're focusing on it, I was usually able to buy five or six uh, for a character and kind of unlock something new on their skill tree each time. Yeah. And another thing that helps get sim points is you can buy or find a chip set that increases the amount of sim points you earn for doing goals yeah. and killing things. Mm-hmm. That's pretty helpful if you're trying to get more points. Yeah, for sure. Uh, you guys mentioned the uh, the hazards around the station, and so the game kind of knows that you're going to become super familiar with the station, so they do a couple of things to shake things up. Uh, one of those is the corruption, but the other one is um, the hazards. And so randomly, uh, each loop, 
things will be a little bit different on the station. So like the the room layout, the level layout, that's all fixed. It will never change. But some things will change, uh, like power will be out in one of the areas. So your, um, I don't know, your elevators won't work. Uh, so you either have to go restore power or figure out another way. Because this is still prey. You can still overcome all of these uh, obstacles by using your knowledge and your skills. Uh, so power might go out. The tram that's like your fast travel system, it might not be working in a particular location. Uh, everything might be on fire. Like Kieran said, you might walk into a place and it's just fire or electricity shooting everywhere. Um, there might be poison gas filling a place. Uh, lots of different things uh, that will force you to adapt. And I like, I didn't have a ton of trouble with this, but there were a couple times like I needed to do something in Riley Yu's office, but it was on fire. And I was like, fuck, like I need to go upstairs, but the stairs are broken and it's on fire. Like, yeah. okay, so it's problem solving time. And then you get into like what I described last episode as this is like peak video game shit. The problem solving in Prey is really good. So I actually really liked this. Yeah. yeah. I had that exact same thing with the fire too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just gave up and died. I was like, fuck it, I'll do it next time. I also really like that, uh, well, it sort of got me into the habit of, okay, first round, first character I pick, I'm going to establish which area doesn't have electricity first and then yeah. solve that problem. And then, you know, also a, a good thing to point out is that there are escape pods, limited amount of escape pods, but it depends on like each round, you don't know which escape pod is going to be available so you have to find a security thing and then right. figure out which escape pod you can actually use but yeah I, you said something earlier about the randomness um this is like the opposite of procedural generation which i absolutely love because every location stays exactly the same but the incidents and the incidentals in each of the locations changes and i yeah. think that's like the most brilliant way to utilize that that sort of mechanic yeah i'd agree i mean at first i don't think i did like it because there were times where i would go into a situation feeling like i'm fully prepared i know what to expect and only to find that it's slightly different <laughs> and my plan has not worked out but when you sort of understand the game a bit better and what to expect you kind of well you don't you don't look forward to these uh changes or problems but <laughs> you know how to deal with no. them and you, and you can you can feel like a a cool survivor list go through these problems like they're nothing yeah you never like walk into a room and it's shooting electricity everywhere and you're like oh sweet but <laughs> yeah, another problem to overcome i can role play as bear grills <laughs> yeah there's no drink your own piss button in prey uh which, maybe death stranding 2 is gonna have that though no, tr no true immersive sim doesn't have that button it's not about doing it in the game you just got to sit down in your armchair with a glass of piss next to you and enjoy it yourself yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a recommendation from Tales from the Backlog and The Good, The Bad, yep. and The Backlog to uh, cozy up, get your favorite armchair in a nice uh, warm or chilled glass of piss, depending on your preference and the weather. This episode is sponsored by Warm Piss. Pro tip, drink pineapple juice. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I can. I don't know what we were talking about now. I completely lost no, track. No. <laughs> no, that's why we have the outline here. Um the uh, the last thing on uh, the the kind of things that's going to throw wrenches in your plans are the Typhon Gates, uh, which is new for this game. Um, mostly in the main game, there were a couple of them, but they were like part of the story, I guess. Um, I don't feel like I had to overcome this in the main game, uh, whereas in this game, they're obstacles, and so they're gates, force fields that won't let you through. Uh, if you have Typhon material and they won't let monsters through and they won't open if there are Typhon nearby. So it starts out as like you get to a Typhon gate, you check the computer, it tells you there are three Typhon, you have to go kill them before the gate will open. Um, but there are other ways to get past that, uh, which took me an embarrassing amount of time to figure out. Um, I got very frustrated a couple of times when I was playing as a character that has Typhon uh, neuromods and stuff and the gates wouldn't open. And I was like, how the f like I was mad. And then I figured out how and I was like, 
Dave, you're an idiot. Like, <laughs> this is prey. Of course they figured out three other ways for you to get through here. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're too easy, though. You, you, you think, like, oh, surely that won't work. It's, it's too easy. I can't just shoot this thing with a stun gun. But yeah, yeah. I was the exact same. <laughs> it took me a bit too long <laughs> to work that one out. Well, keep, keep in mind, I never had a stun gun. Uh, throughout the entire game <laughs> that does make uh, it unless i difficult. found one unless i found one yeah i never had a stun gun wow it's quite impressive i don't know what to say i figured it out straight away <laughs> <laughs> it's just pro gamer tips with adam yeah pineapple juice and use a stun gun <laughs> that's uh, right but yeah i bet you had a fucking a, a walkthrough run into your side no <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I'm very proud to say that I didn't consult a guide or a walkthrough at any point during this game. Oh, nice. Right, right. Yeah, I figured it out all by myself, Mr. 30 Hours. <laughs> <laughs> I had to check one uh, a few times. Um, and one of those times was, how do I get past the Typhon Gate when I am Typhon myself? <laughs> oh, sh- you know what? I just lied. I completely made a liar out of myself. I did right. consult a guide once. We're shutting this shit down. Yep. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Lights off. Everyone go home. Um, I had to figure out where to get uh, control modules from. I was like, where the hell do I get oh. a control module from? Um, and then it was Harvester. So, I was like, okay, yeah. problem solved. Um, but that was the only time. Yeah. Sure. A couple other things, I guess, about this game um, before getting into like final thoughts and spoiler time um i think that this game has a little bit less like music than the uh the main game the main game has some like very identifiable themes Mm -hmm. and stuff um this game is a lot more kind of reserved which i i mean i i don't assume that they would like hire mick gordon to come back and do music for this soundtrack actually i think mick gordon had a falling out with bethesda anyway so Mm -hmm. they were like no more uh, that main, that famous main prey theme and stuff like that. Not really a part of it here. But I do just, I fucking love the sound effects in this game. And it's continuing in this. Like when you pick up a neuromod, that little ditty that plays <laughs> uh, the phantoms like mumbling out in the distance. All that stuff is really fun. Love it. Yeah. I love the sound design. Um, I did not know anything about that composer having an issue with Bethesda. Do you know what it was about? Uh, I think it was about, Beth- well, I feel like everyone who was a part of this game had an issue with Bethesda, like just yeah, being too yeah. micromanaging and stuff. Um, but I, I don't remember. Listen to the episode about Prey with Nick and Will because they told that story and I forget because I'm recording this uh, four weeks later. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Bethesda well, seems to have, to have a way with now. people. Yes, they do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, other than that, um, you did raise a good point. I definitely did not notice the music in this game or in the dlc nearly as much as i did in the main game um i think maybe some of the tracks were playing on like a a record player or something one of the levels i think yeah there's one in the in the crew quarters just by the elevators there's there's a little jukebox so you can put on um like the theme song and some others there might be a few other locations as well yeah i definitely remember hearing it but i just couldn't put my finger on where i'd heard it yeah that's cool the voice acting was good too, by the way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there was good voice acting. Um, you're you're kind of doing the same thing as the main game, where uh, you are alone uh, when you're playing the game. You're playing a simulation, but you're still kind of alone, and you're listening to a lot of audio logs and stuff like that. And the voice acting was good. Yeah. Did you notice? Uh, maybe this is a spoiler thing. I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did you notice that one of the characters was a homosexual? I did. It's yeah. Uh, yeah, it was nice. How progressive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it actually, um, I didn't realize it at the time because the person that they were photographed with. So, one of the characters wakes up and they have this photograph of them and their quote unquote partner or lover or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's two guys. But at the time, I didn't realize because the person that he was with was so androgynous. I was like, oh, it's a butch looking lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I definitely did not know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah there you go <laughs> yeah i was trying to i was looking in the uh looking in the credits here to see um who's and i did, definitely don't see mick gordon as a part of uh this one here yeah there's not That's much the music that i can really recall from moon crash yeah um a lot more reserved yeah. there there is some for sure but yeah uh not those not those sweet themes um 
from the main game. Yeah. So uh, let's get into kind of some final thoughts uh, before we get into spoilers and housekeeping and stuff like that. Uh, the question to ask, uh, to question to answer in this section is uh, just who would you recommend Prey Moon Crash to, guys? Oh, it's got to be people that have played Prey. Yeah, kind of, kind of goes by saying. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, fine. I thought I had a winner of an answer there, but you just shot me down. Great. Um, I would recommend it to people who like sci-fi and puzzles because I think the roguelike elements in the game itself is just like one big puzzle and sort of resource manager and, um, oh, if you like to-do lists and planning things <laughs> and you're very organized like I am, because mm-hmm. uh, I have a to-do list on my fridge that I fill out every single day. It's like, wash the dishes, edit the podcast, vacuum the floor, <laughs> work out. Anyway, Make to-do the list point is, tomorrow. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> buy pineapple juice. <laughs> <laughs> the, the point is, if you're, you like organization and pre-planning and stuff, I think this game is for you because- who doesn't love problem solving, planning your day and hacking computers and, you know, saving yourself from an alien invasion? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's spot on. Thanks. Comparing it to do, to do list is quite accurate. Um, <laughs> like, there were times I was playing this where I definitely made note of things. Uh, just to, I know my mind, I know that I forget what I was thinking at the time. And then like 10 minutes later, when it comes around to it, I'll have forgotten what I was thinking. Um, so I just like write a few things down just so like, when I've got the next player, this person needs to go here. Uh, and there is like the puzzle element of knowing who needs to go where, at what time, when, and what comes after and all this and you know it's not that complex once you've done it and once you've worked it all out but it's pretty fun and it's it's just like if if you like the main game prey if you like immersive sims if you like having multiple options to do many things then this is for you and the whole like vibe uh design of the um talos one or pythias area is is a whole vibe in itself and if you like that then you know you're just going to enjoy wandering around looking at stuff i know i certainly did this this, this probably equates to like half of my playtime actually um <laughs> <laughs> just like reading the emails uh maybe not reading all the books some of those are a little bit too tedious but uh-huh. y- you can spend as long as you want in it like you don't necessarily have to do all of the story missions there and then and then call it quits you know you could just you could just carry on playing really if you wanted to yeah yeah i i agree this is this is a game that if you like the main game prey um i find it really hard to believe that you wouldn't like this unless you just like hate roguelikes uh, and hate you know starting over and feeling like you're doing the same thing multiple times uh, because i did i did have a couple times where i Maybe I got like three characters out and then a character died in some like surprise way. And I was like, fuck, I have yeah. to, you know, I got to do this <laughs> stuff again. Happened a couple times. But um, if you like the main game, Prey, um, if you played Deathloop and you were left wanting by uh, that puzzle element of it, then this game has that. I, th- I really think that this is like more of what you uh, would want. Uh, this game is, like I said before, it's a little bit less like kinetically fun than death loop uh to like run and sprint and slide and shoot all of those things are less fun in this game but uh the gameplay itself is you know it's the same as the main game prey the shooting and stuff it's fine it's not great but it's okay um and it's it's really all about those like overcoming those challenges and puzzling out um how you're going to get through that final loop uh, which i had an absolute blast with um through some moments of frustration, but overall, uh, I had a really good time with it. And this is just continuing, um, arcane, just being a really fucking good developer. Like just the stuff they make is quality. And I knew I've said, I've made negative comparisons about death loop, but I do want to reiterate. I think that game's really good. Uh, just this game succeeds at one specific area where death loop kind of fell short. Uh, so play this, I feel like a lot of people listening, you played the main game Prey, but didn't play Moon Crash, uh, because I hear so many people say how good Prey is, um, but very few people 
talking about how good Moon Crash is. So if you are like that, please play this. It's very good. Agreed. I'm very surprised that people who have access to Prey and have played it would not play this. But then again, like I said earlier, I'm not a DLC person. So if we hadn't been, yeah. you know, uh, if, if you hadn't twisted our arms into playing it, we probably would have <laughs> not played it for a little while and then missed out on this great experience. Uh, curiously, though, are you looking forward to Redfall or whatever it's called? I am. I am looking forward to it more now. When it first got announced, I had the I thought that it was a multiplayer only game, yeah. uh, which I am not up for. Like if it's multiplayer only, I won't play it. I don't care who makes it. Uh, but now that I know that there is a single player element, yes, for sure. Cool. Yeah, I think it looks sweet. Vampires are fun. <laughs> yeah, and Arcane is very. They have a certain style that I can imagine that like it's going to be cool to look at. The levels are going to be fun to explore for sure. There, Arcane's at, at that point now where any single player game that they put out, it's automatic. I will play it. I trust them. I know that they're good. That's so sweet. <laughs> I, kind, I kind of agree. And that's only basing it off of Prey and Prey Moon Crash. Like, there's such an attention to detail in those games and they're so unique to Arcane. Or at least what I imagine is mm-hmm. unique to Arcane, that uh, I kind of just trust them to to make a decent game because it doesn't seem like they yeah. follow trends so much. Um, try to like catch on to the latest thing, uh, so they're quite unique. And it's just a shame about how the sort of like publicity and advertise and even naming of Prey went down. And I think like the fact that <laughs> it was called Prey and by bethesda sort of making them call it that uh it didn't help yeah people uh buy the game and experience it and i, I do think a lot of people would enjoy it they just they, it's just gone under their radar yeah uh, the dishonored games are really really good uh if you guys um haven't played those those are excellent like if you like prey i find it hard to believe you wouldn't like at least dishonored too yeah. um and death loop again fun game uh so redfall I'm pretty confident in saying it's also going to be fun. Mm. Uh, So pretty easy to recommend Arcane um, as a studio at this point. Uh, So let's get into a little bit of housekeeping before the spoiler section. Uh, First things first, you guys plug uh, the good, the bad, and the backlog. Where can people find you? You can find us on all of the usual podcast places. Yeah. Yeah. I believe <laughs> Spotify is one of them. <laughs> <laughs> let's list them. <laughs> Go on. Uh, yeah. let's, I list, believe let's list every podcast platform. <laughs> Apple might have a podcast system. Uh, possibly They Google. might. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, but no, if you want to find us on like social media and stuff, you can just go to our link tree, which I've heard recently is very like boomer thing to have a, a link tree. It's so convenient. You know though. what? We might as well just embrace it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, All it's the links in one be old place. Fashion. Apparently, it's just not hip to have one anymore, but whatever. I'm not going to change it. I so. actively avoid being hip. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, because you've already broken one of your hips. You've got a metal one. <laughs> okay. So, you can find us on Linktree, which is linktr.ee slash goodbadbacklog. And there's just links to our Instagram, Twitter. Uh, I haven't linked to Facebook because I never fucking update it. But yeah, all those good things. So, uh, come say hi (laughs) yeah um i will put that link tree down in the show notes so people can find it easily Uh um and also while you're listening to me talk about tales from the backlog just go to your podcast app search the good the bad and the backlog and uh, download a few episodes because i think it's really quality stuff um so now time to talk about me (laughs) for tales from the backlog Best things to do, same as always. Uh, If you've enjoyed the show, consider leaving a rating and review. That's very helpful. Um, The Discord server is uh, is gone. We're having a good time. Join and talk about games. We would love to have you. Uh, Consider supporting on Patreon. And consider listening to a Top 3 podcast, which is my other show, doing Top 3 lists. um, Sometimes about video games, but most often about uh, the other things we really care about, like sandwiches and stuff like that. So that's a top three podcast. Uh, Give that a shot. Uh, We are going to take a break. And when we come back, it's spoiler time for Prey Moon Crash. Now it's time to beat the mind game. Now it's time to beat the mind game. And now it's time to beat the mind game.
All right, I am back with Adam and Kieran, and it is time for spoilers for Prey Moon Crash. And we're going to start by talking about the uh, kind of character quests, um, any of them that were memorable. Uh, There's, well, I'm acting like there's so many of them that we don't have time to talk about them. There's only five, (laughs) but uh, some of them are more memorable than others. So I guess I'll, I'll ask you guys, were there any of these that you thought were more uh, fun or more um, interesting than the others. Well, I um, think, I the, think s- you go first. Uh, yeah, um, I forgot the name. What, is it was it Claire, the uh, the spy? Yeah, Claire. Yeah, um, yeah. I found the custodian. Yeah, the custodian. Um, I found her story probably the most enjoyable. It was the most interesting, uh, and like there, there was quite a lot of different aspects to it, and it sort of made sense for other part of the stories as well how it linked with uh, riley and how, how it ended up with riley like that was quite grim um but she was also quite the most enjoyable to play play with it i, I would have thought but they, they all had quite a bit of intrigue to them and it uh it was it took me a while to actually do the stories i have to say like i did a first few <laughs> runs where i was just like running around learning the area and then whenever I got to the character mm-hmm. selection, I was just like, oh, how do I unlock this person? And then um, <laughs> that's when I sort of realized there was the story things. I, I managed to have Andre. Is that Andre? Yeah. Uh, Andreas. Andreas. You start with Andreas, and then I somehow unlocked VJ. But the other three, I just thought, have I got to do random in-game things to unlock these? Like, <laughs> get to a certain level with neuromods or some shit? <laughs> this is when I hadn't even seen the story missions, so... I did like two runs where I was just Andre and then Andre and Vijay. Um, and it was it was probably the third loop when I realized you had story things to do. So, yeah, that that, that was me being a dumbass, I think, just not actually looking at the, the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a bit weird. Don't know just how I kind of avoided that. Yeah. Because if I, was, <laughs> if I was like giving advice to someone to play this game, it would be immediately do the story so that you can knock all the characters. Yeah. Otherwise, you, you're just like faffing around for absolutely no reason so there's some characters that you can't um un- that you can't unlock unless you do story objectives for other characters but the uh vj the security guy you can't even you you unlock him by just finding his dead body and i just didn't find it i had to look in a guide for where it is i just, oh. i wasn't gonna like i got to the point where i had all the characters unlock that i could and i needed vj and i Once I found, like, I looked up how to unlock him and it says find his body. Or it says that on the screen. I can't remember uh, Uh in the game. And then I was like, I'm not going to search this entire station looking for one dead body. (laughs) So I just looked in a guide for where it is. Ah, you know what? That that kind of, yeah, that brings back memories of me playing and finding his body. And then just naturally assuming that, well, to unlock the other three, I must also have to find their dead bodies. So right. that would have mm-hmm. commenced a large search of all the rooms trying to search for all these <laughs> other characters for which I didn't know at the time would be in vain and for absolutely nothing. So Yeah, it yeah. suddenly makes so much <laughs> sense eventually. that it took you 30 hours. <laughs> yeah, there were, the, the puzzle pieces are coming together. Yeah, for yeah sure. I had quite a big blonde <laughs> moment there. Yeah, I found his dead body like the second loop <laughs> i was like okay done um but uh speaking of the custodian the thing i liked most about her character is that on the character selection screen before you've actually unlocked her she just looks like a janitor but then as soon as you unlock her you realize she's yeah. a spy it turns into a spy yeah, yeah. which i thought was yeah. genius because i was literally like i knew that she would be the one with the hacking skills but i was like wait a minute why is this chick with a fucking janitor's hat and a broom going to be the character that has the ability to hack computers <laughs> it doesn't make sense yeah. and then it all falls into place <laughs> so she also has a laser sword yeah which right. is not a janitor's tool <laughs> <laughs> i didn't like uh i didn't really like her story that you have to go through because it, it's basically just like um go from place to place, find this, put it in a recycler, and then go to the next place, find this, put it in a recycler. But I like how it ends because it's uh, it's sci-fi corporate uh, dystopia shit yeah. uh, where her yeah. her handling company um, is basically like, yeah, do all this stuff. We'll get you off the station. We promise we'll get you off the station. <laughs> and then uh, surprise, when you surprise. complete your objectives... 
yeah when you complete the objectives they're just like oh uh yeah we're not gonna be able to get you off the station sorry yeah and then it's over that's it yeah <laughs> that yeah. was cool but then her story does continue on in like the other characters arcs like vijay yeah yeah I, I did i did enjoy that how they all linked up some somewhat that was pretty cool. yeah yeah like um i think i read somewhere that each character ending is canonically like detailed in one of the other stories so for example she is supposed to escape in an escape pod and one of the other characters i think it's vj um he has the option to blow it up or not is that right? Yeah. 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 That's his. Yep. Yeah. So all of their fates are sealed by other characters. Like, for example, um, Riley, you, uh, Claire, the custodian, has implanted something on this operator, which is supposed to, like, delete her consciousness or kill her or something when she does it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's all cool. But as for, like, my actual favorite character story, I think it's got to be Andreas because of the whole, like, um, what are those Typhon called? The psycho ones that like trick you. The technomancer? Telepaths. Yeah, the telepaths. Telepaths. Yeah. So he's being controlled by a telepath and he's seeing his son or whatever. And it's like the telepath has manipulated him into escaping with it so it can get out of the, the moon base and then infect the rest of the world or whatever. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I... Uh, I also had that as my like most interesting one um, because you are kind of being controlled by this telepath. And during this one, uh, lots of interesting things happen. Uh, the Typhon are not hostile to you yeah. during this uh, thing, which was really cool. Uh, but the security operators are. So you can run past the moon shark and all of those fucking annoying enemies out in the crater. But you have to fight uh, the robots um, and turrets and stuff like that. Uh, and then you, you're supposed to get your son's toy and put it in an escape pod and escape. And that's how you do it. Um, but, uh, when you get it in there, you find out that the toy is a mimic and then the telepath explodes your head and that's how the story ends. Yeah. And I thought that was a really cool ending. Um, and so this got me thinking like, was this how the Typhon got to earth? Um, like a prequel to like stuff that's going on in the main game and so i looked it up the developers said no like definitively no this is not how it happened but it did make me think that oh i thought it was a yes because what's his face the guy in the the actual simulation who's doing all these other characters um i don't know if you want to talk about this right now but he theoretically escapes and then there's like a final post credit scene thing where it's assumed that his space shuttle has landed on Earth and there's a mimic in it. Yeah. 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 Um, and I, all of these things really made me think that this is some kind of prequel to story content in the main game. Yeah. And the developers like specifically said, this is not a prequel. So even though it makes a lot of sense, they said no. But developers yeah. are liars. Which I don't know why they, I had, they could. I mean, developers have lied about story stuff in the past yeah. just to, get people talking but it it sure seemed like it was a prequel to me yeah yeah i agree i i got that impression too but then i did find this cool reddit post of just someone who was trying to list all the events of both prey and pay prey moon crash sort of chronologically and there were like things that sort of intermingled and were going along in parallel and kind of made sense i have to i can't find the post i really remember the actual content of it much but when you put it together it did kind of make sense that it wasn't necessarily just a prequel like things were happening at the same time Mm -hmm. so i i I think that there was some suggestion that earth was already screwed while this was going on can't remember why or the logic behind that but (laughs) it it sort of gives the idea why alex wanted uh, talos one to be Noel waved in prey because the moon was a goner and earth was already a goner Mm -hmm. yeah but that was a simulation so that version of talos one oh, was happening point, at point. exactly the same yeah. time as moon crash <laughs> so but because that version that you play in the first game is a simulation oh, yeah 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 you know what i mean so easy to forget <laughs> yeah and um that kind of made me sort of a little disappointed with the story content of moon crash because 
the story content of Prey is so out there and so wild that I was sort of expecting something very similar to happen in the DLC. And once it was over, uh-huh. I was like, ah, oh, there's not really a big twist or anything, but you know, no, it's fine. There's there's some surprises, but there's not a, a whole lot of big twists. I wrote down that this kind of follows the same kind of sci-fi corporate dystopian story stuff that so many sci-fi games set in space do. Uh, like the main game has a bit of this with uh, kind of people being expendable a little bit, but like games like Tacoma and Deliver Us the Moon mm-hmm. and stuff like that, they're all very similar to like how the story of this actually goes um, with uh, Chasma and uh, the, the other one, Basilisk, I think, is the spy mm. agency, yeah. just kind of just treating people as uh, super expendable, which is what happens with um, Peter uh, as you go through the story of this game. T- Tacoma's a good uh, comparison. It's very much like a yeah. prey story, but without the difficulties. It's, it's yeah. the pleasant little walk through a ship compared to getting attacked by savage aliens <laughs> moon sharks and shit yeah. yeah yeah big uh big recommendation for anyone listening who hasn't played tacoma go play that the game rules yeah i did like that that's good um sorry to change the subject yeah, go ahead but uh <laughs> but i don't care about what you're talking about so i want to talk about something else i wanted to <laughs> i want to keep talking about tacoma no i'm just kidding but um we mentioned like characters that we liked story-wise but I was curious yeah. if you had any particular character that you preferred to play as, like which one was your favorite skill-wise and stuff? Uh, let me figure that out. Kieran, what what was yours? Oh, probably Claire. Yeah, I'm, j- I'm just a big Claire fan over here, probably because one of the newer mods, I think it's, the, oh, maybe Claire and VJ actually, because VJ was just co- kind of brutish and going around with a shotgun, blasting Tithe at her phantoms and shit was good was good fun right yeah um but i think they both had the ability where you could just like double their walking speed and just running around jumping exceedingly (laughs) high with those two characters was great fun but yeah but to say favorite that is quite tough because now i think about the um typhon powers that some of them unlocked did make gameplay quite easy at times when you could just like mind jack some phantoms and get them to fight to fight for you or uh bring some of them back from the dead and turn them into a phantom that will fight for you or like uh get the robotic enemies to fight with you like all that stuff is super super good um and made like getting through past the mine sh- the the moon shark uh super easy at times as well so i think each character has got quite a bit going for them which makes them all slightly enjoyable to play i think yeah yeah it's hard for me to pick like a favorite to play with i i guess i would say um i had a good time with uh riley uh because of that mind jack and uh joan the uh engineer um i had a good time because she can summon a turret mm. uh, to fight with her the the main thing is that almost all of the characters have some ability that makes it easy to run past enemies and it <laughs> took me a while to figure this out um but using mind jack to mind jack the moon shark and just run past it instead of beating my head up against trying to fight it um or using vj's uh like freeze time ability Mm. to run away from stuff um which i said this in the uh the main episode for prey but i'll I'll tell you guys too um i didn't use mind jack in the main game or not mind jack the uh slow time combat focus i didn't use it in the main game because it didn't sound good like i just like something didn't register in my head that that would be useful and then in this game vj has it and it's the best it makes things so easy that i was like playing the main game on hard mode almost because i didn't like register in my head yes (laughs) freezing time would make this game easier you obviously haven't watched charmed because we all know that freezing time is the best power you're right i have not watched charmed and that was my downfall in the main game of prey (laughs) yeah you would have thought that a shitty show from the 90s would change your life um i actually my favorite was joan as well strictly because of the turret and for some reason i just liked lugging a turret around to have that shoot for me like just carrying it around like in front of you yeah yeah like as soon as I was done with it and the enemies were dead that were in front of me, I'd pick it back up and then I would go somewhere else, <laughs> lure it into a bottleneck and then just have the turret take care of it. So, mm-hmm. yeah, she was fun. And um, I also really liked 
Andreas, because of his Typhon abilities, he had the most offensive abilities. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I liked playing with him, especially because in the main game, I never really used Typhon abilities. I was strictly like weapons only, no Typhon abilities, mm. you know, human playthrough. Yeah. yeah. So, you guys both said that. Were you motivated by the trophy or were you motivated by the game kind of telling you like hey using too many typhon things is a bad idea oh for that- me it was partly because i mean trophy for one <laughs> but uh <laughs> mostly because i had invested some points into some of the skills that would um help the turrets like so i would have the turrets be like 150 damage, uh, that sort of thing. And then if I had Typhon abilities, I was concerned that the turrets would then <laughs> attack me and that would be bad. <laughs> so I just, I wanted to to be like a pure human. But yeah, if, if I had my time again, I'd probably divulge and go into uh, into more Typhon powers and, and try out some, uh, some new ones. Yeah, um, my decision to do that was strictly because I didn't want to be evil so as soon as it said like turrets can target you if you have typhon abilities like well i'm not going to get any typhon abilities i'm going to be as human as possible as well yeah yeah um i did eventually do a second playthrough with typhon stuff but i think i played it on like super easy and i only did that to get a trophy so i didn't really enjoy (laughs) that playthrough whereas this time i could actually have typhon abilities and use them strategically with a purpose so I had a lot more fun this time around. That is four for four on the guests I've had on the Prey episodes. All have done human playthroughs in the main game uh, for various reasons, but mostly because the game like warns you like like you're going to be playing on hard mode if you have Typhon abilities. But um, what I found out is that turrets are easy to kill. They're not a big deal, especially yeah. if you have these big psycho shock powers. Yeah. Um, so my prey playthrough i ended up becoming so typhon that turrets attacked me and it was fine because the typhon abilities are great um the one thing i didn't use was the mimic ability in the main game Mm. um and so being able to do that as uh riley i want to say um in moon crash was a lot of fun just hopping around as a stapler and stuff (laughs) it's good comedy yeah yeah I mean, it was sort of useful at certain times. It it was only really useful like once or twice, but it was fun. Most of the time I forgot it was even there. Same. So let's get into kind of talking about those final runs and um, how we got through those. Uh, So I don't know how you guys want to do this. Do you want to talk about like, do you want to just say the order first of how you got through them? Then we can kind of get into story time. Yeah, I guess I I would think that a lot of our orders are going to be quite similar. Yeah. So I guess we can just gauge that first. So I did, um, I did the custodian first 
uh, then the engineer. Uh, so that was Claire, and then Joan, and then VJ, and then Andreas, and then Riley was the last one for me. I think for me, I did Andreas at the last, but I can't quite remember. I started with Joan or Claire, but it was it was one or the other. And then following them, I want to say it was Riley, uh, followed by VJ, then Andreas. What about Joan? Okay. She was either first or second. I can't remember oh. if, I, if I did Claire or Joan first. Sorry, I <laughs> didn't think you said a name. Um, to be honest, I played this like three weeks ago, so I'm struggling to remember what my order was, but it was definitely something like, uh, I think it was like Claire, Joan, Andreas, VJ, and then Riley. Mm. Yeah. Or it may even have been Riley first, to be honest. Okay. I, I figure if there is going to be a a commonality between everyone's playthroughs, uh, it's probably doing Claire and Joan first so that you can unlock the mimic portal. You have to go repair it and then you have to go hack the computer. You need to unlock the mimic portal, yeah. Yeah. Um, And you need both of them to do that. Uh, So I guess the... I don't have a lot of like really interesting things with Joan and Claire um, because I use their powers to run past everything. Uh, Go hack the computer or repair the mimic portal um, but my first person, uh, Claire, um, I hacked the computer. Um, oh, I, I always uh, use the first person too to check where the escape pod was. Like you said, Adam, um, figure out where the power is out. I always crafted control modules uh, so that I could just restore power to the whole station um, with that first person. And then uh, so Claire went, opened up her part of the mimic portal. Then I ran to... Uh, Uh, the crew annex and i took the shuttle uh, out with claire and then i went in with joan repaired the mimic portal and then escaped there with her so that was like the first two for me was just getting the mimic portal open and then Mm. using it oh interesting yeah i sort of did like preparatory runs like with the first character (laughs) i can't remember if it was joan or claire i did like most of the stuff of the preparation with one character early on in like corruption level one, making sure it was kept low with delay loop times. And I would just go and prepare everything else as much as I could. So the mimic mm-hmm. portal, I would get that done. Um, the moonworks thing with the, with the rads and the, uh, the food, I would do all that. Yeah. Um, and everything else. So that when, when it came to the other characters, all they really needed to do was just like run to the area and click escape. And, uh, if I found any like control modules or escape pod navigation things, I would just like chuck them in the mule. Um, so if I needed them later, and uh, <laughs> the th- mule. that meant yeah. that like, yeah, <laughs> that meant that my last run was really quick. It was like probably like half an hour, you know, just getting everyone. Interesting. Out. Yeah. Yeah. I did something similar. I think I started, I'm fairly certain that I might've used Riley first. Um, now that I'm thinking about it. I think I used Riley because the getting your um, consciousness out or whatever is slightly more complicated. You know, I'm struggling to remember. But anyway, the point is I would have her. I would sort out the whole like, like every time I'd run through, I would grab as much food as I can and I'd just chuck it onto the mule itself. And then that way I didn't have to run over to Moonworks and put it into that little escape thing. I could just have the mule pulled up. You remember that mule, the one that you didn't know about that you're regretting? Oh, about? God. You, I, <laughs> incredibly <laughs> useful mule. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead and finish, Adam. But you're <laughs> you're going to see why I'm making all these faces over here. Okay. Well, I basically stuck with like every single character's quote unquote story escape thing. So, mm. okay, I... Used Riley. I did her consciousness zap out thing. I did that. Then I used Claire and Joan back to back to repair the mimic portal and to hack the computer. So I think I used Claire on the shuttle and I used Joan in the escape pod or it could be vice versa. And then I got Mm -hmm. Andreas to just run through the mimic portal itself. And then I ended with VJ in that little moonworks thing. And he just pulled okay. up the mule, took all the, the food out, put that in the thing, walked in, done and dusted. Damn. Yeah. All right. So I found through the game, I found Riley's to be the easiest to do uh, oh. with the consciousness uh, mm. upload thing. 
I found that to be the simplest, so I saved that for last when things were at the highest corruption, etc. The reason I was making all those faces is because I did the mass driver, uh, the thing in Moonworks. Mm-hmm. I did that third uh, with VJ, but um, I didn't know about the mule, so I crafted <laughs> the anti-radiation thing. Um, I went to Moonworks and I searched for it must have been a half hour for enough food and drinks. <laughs> and like, I was like desperate. I went everywhere uh, in Moonworks looking for that, uh, looking for food. And I was at a point where I had like, you need five food and five drinks. And I was at a point where I had like five food and I was just like, I need drinks. I need like anything, seriously, <laughs> like desperation. And then I was like, just kind of running shuttle running, basically looking for rooms that I missed. And there's a vending machine right next to the shuttle station in Moonworks. (laughs) And I just didn't see it. (laughs) And so when I found that, I was like, simultaneously like, Dave, how did you miss this? But also like, yes, give me that coffee and tea and all of that stuff. (laughs) And then I got through the um, mass driver. But by the time I got through that, I was at corruption level four because it had taken me so long. Um, and that's why I was glad I saved uh, Riley for last because mm-hmm. hers was the easiest uh, for me. Yeah. Um, and then fourth, the fourth person I did was Andreas. And I had a good little story with this one. Uh, I was using the escape pod with him and I crafted the escape pod navigation chip so I wouldn't have to find one. Um, I had it all planned out. And then I got to the escape pod area And there was a telepath guarding it. And I had a lot of trouble with Andreas. I found him to be very squishy, like die quickly. Yeah. So it was a tense battle against the telepath and like the six humans that it was controlling. (laughs) Um, So I killed all of them. And I was like, finally, it's corruption level four. Finally, I can get through this uh, portal or this uh, escape pod. But there's a um, Typhon gate blocking it. And I didn't have... (laughs) a stun gun and Andreas doesn't have the electric power and I didn't have any EMP grenades. And I was like, fuck, like, like my entire excitement was just like, Oh no, how do I do this? And I just got frustrated and I shot the Typhon thing. And it just so happened that I had crafted a pistol that randomly had electric damage (laughs) just (laughs) randomly. And I shot it and it opened and I was like, Oh, and just ran through. And then uh, Riley's was easy, like no trouble. I just ran past everything and did the consciousness. Mm. But it was like just like a stroke of good <laughs> fortune that I had randomly gotten electric bullets. Nice. It was crazy. Did you did you not unlock the burrow mati- uh, um, neuromod with Andreas? Uh, I didn't get that far in the skill trees because I was spending mm. a lot of money on stuff that was not neuromods. Right, so I right. would say I unlocked like half of each character's skill tree. Yeah, hmm. yeah. Because with the burrow mod, you can just go under. Yeah, that's right. You can go yeah. under stuff. Yeah. yeah, I didn't do. I didn't get that far. Oh, I didn't yeah. know you could do that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it didn't really matter to me because I had a stun gun <laughs> on every single character. <laughs> yeah, it didn't matter because Adam was Adam was playing with Galaxy Brain. That's it. Uh, for this game. <laughs> But yeah, did you guys have any of those? Uh, I wrote them down as tight butthole moments where I was just like all puckered up, really having like a stressful time. Yeah, I definitely had a few, um, especially early on in the game when the characters weren't particularly leveled up. Like Riley, for some reason, I had a lot of issues with her just dying all the time. Like I would get to like three characters in and then she would be there. And then the first thing that would happen was she would just die. And I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, Riley, get it together. (laughs) You're the director. Yeah. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Come on. Direct your ass into that fucking escape pod. <laughs> and like, Andreas, as much as I liked him, you're right. He is quite squishy. So, at certain points when I was being really careless about things and I just didn't worry about killing things, I was just like, you know what? I'll just run through, whatever. Um, there are times when I forgot to put one of those little jetpack things on the characters. So, it's like my maneuverability is just not there like I need it to be. And I relied on that a lot. So, me trying to run away from things without that little zippy thing on his back, he just would get killed instantly. So, Mm. yeah. There were also a couple times uh, where if you go down to the 
the power station. Um, there's a path that goes straight into Pythias Labs, but it's blocked sometimes. Yes. Um, and there were a couple of times when I just got unlucky and it was blocked and then I had to go deal with all the shit. Um, and on my final run, it was unblocked and I was like, okay, let's make this one count. Yeah, you can get through that with Riley as a uh, mimic, I think. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Oh, is there is there a hole is you there a little hole. squeeze through? Yeah. Okay. She's got a little gap. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't really save much time anyway, because you could like run to the command center pretty quick. Yeah. That's true. Did you guys use the um the Typhon killer null wave mm, thing that yeah. is introduced in Riley's story? Yeah, the towers. No. Yeah, I did. I used them a few times. <laughs> Again, Adam's just <laughs> nope. I just you know didn't need any extra help. I was doing fine the whole time. Well, it seemed like it was more trouble than it was worth. Like it took too much effort to get more control modules, and I didn't really need to do it when you can just run through everything. You know. True. True. Yeah. I found quite a few control modules lying about. So if I had them, I'd like stick them in the mule, and then the next character would go up to the command center and chuck them in, and just yeah. If anything. It gets more sim points very easily just by killing all the monsters in the area. So it's like it's the, easy money. I, I'm just thinking back to all these times I had useful items uh, where, <laughs> and I would often forget, like, uh, I would often forget to, I would be like, okay, I found a bunch of cool stuff. I'm going to drop this like near the shuttle station or something for the next character because I for, didn't know about the mule. I didn't know it could do that. Uh, between runs and then i would just forget and i would get all i would like struggle my way to the escape point whatever it was and then um i would be like fuck i forgot to drop these neuro mods and stuff for the next character like i don't have enough to buy the next skill tree thing but i don't want to run back and then run back here so fuck it i'm leaving and if I knew about the mule, that would have never been an issue. <laughs> well, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Except, uh, yeah, sucks. If I if I were you, Dave, I would simply utilize all the things in the game. I would know everything. You just need to you know, be a pro like me. That's um, right. Yeah. <laughs> if I were you, I would simply be good at video games. Yeah, I'm, I'm sending you my thoughts and <laughs> prayers for that unlucky run of events. I, I appreciate that, <laughs> but... I I did I did think that the final run was like super tense and uh pulling it off gave me like an amazing feeling of satisfaction uh because I did have to overcome a bunch of problems and I did use all the knowledge that I had uh from mm. the entire game yeah. except for the mule all the knowledge <laughs> that I had all the knowledge I possessed well it's even more impressive that you did it without using the mule so <laughs> you know <laughs> oh actually that reminds me you mentioned butthole clenching moments the biggest butthole yeah. clenching moments i had was when i had a status effect on me like uh oh yeah bleeding or a fracture yeah. or something <laughs> that was a pain in the ass the moon shark gives you those if you get hit by its mm, attacks yeah. and uh, so there's a lot of times i started a run by getting hit by the moon shark bleeding and then it's like fuck i gotta um i, I i'm just like I my imagine my character like just hobbling along, like dragging a yeah. dead leg or something like that. <laughs> What's it like lacer <laughs> laceration or something? But uh, mm. it's you can't run or jump without losing health, and yeah, that was such a pain in the ass. But uh, I eventually got it. My my final run was so cruisy that I felt like I cheated <laughs> because. Damn. I invested in, like, I had so many sim points. I was just like, you know what? I'm just going to buy five of these hourglasses. I'm going to buy med kits. I'm going to buy um, every single character I bought a stun gun for, a handgun, and, like, 90 bullets. So, I just, like, ran through. Every time the corruption even got close to one, I would use a, a fucking hourglass thing, and it was fine. So, <laughs> it never got past corruption one in my final run and now that i'm just like you know what i should probably attempt it seriously but i just <laughs> i had the resources that's a challenge mode for prey moon crash yeah no mule no hourglass yeah yeah <laughs> but i just feel like it was so accessible to me i had all these options at my fingertips why wouldn't i want to you know make it as easy as possible because i had a feeling yeah. going in like this final run is going to be a real challenge but for me it just wasn't interesting 
Yeah, it, you're not the you're not the only person to tell me that like they were swimming in money too or sim points. I was just like I was strapped for sim points the entire game. Um, maybe because if I started a run and things didn't go well, I would often just kill my character and reset the loop oh. um, instead of like continuing. Yeah, I would always finish it, and then at least that way I would get some points from successfully yeah. escaping. Mm. That's probably a better way to go about it than I did. Yeah. Yeah. So you uh, you finish the loop. Um, we kind of talked about this before, but uh, you finish the loop, you complete your orders as Peter, um, and it's time to go home because Kazma promised. They promised uh, that they would take you home, and then they send a message that says, oops, uh, we can't afford to bring you home. And uh, they try to blow up your little station there, uh, which was kind of a crazy moment. Um, you get put into the uh, the zero G navigation, which gave me motion sickness, just like it did in the main game. Uh, but luckily, it's not a big point, um, uh, not a big uh, thing throughout Moon Crash. Um, so you grab some oxygen. Uh, you get put on a timer. Um, you pilot your little thing into the uh facility your ship you crash in there and you survive um and then like we said earlier you find a space shuttle just chilling on the surface of the moon you get inside you uh take it to earth um but a mimic went along for the ride uh and again not a prequel to the events of uh prey so i don't know interesting but yeah that's the end of uh moon crash um anything else that you guys have before we uh say goodbye here i failed that section by the way because i didn't know where to find the oxygen <laughs> oh really <laughs> i was like what, what the hell the galaxy brain over there well yeah, <laughs> yeah evidently not even the <laughs> smartest uh squirrel misses the nut once in a while <laughs> <laughs> That old proverb. Yeah. I remember my grandpa telling me yeah. that one. <laughs> Passed down from Confucius. Yeah. But yeah, anyway, I, I failed that and I died because I was like, I thought that I had to go to that little uh, computer thing uh, mm. up in the vent. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll yeah. just like flick some switches and the oxygen will come back on. Nope. I had to go down and get it. Takes a, a while. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I good game. Yeah. <laughs> good game. Good game. <laughs> really enjoyed it. More people need to play it. Yeah. And. It's uh, I like uh, all three of us are here saying more people need to play it. It's a shame that people don't play this. Mm. But all three of us at the beginning of the episode said I played Prey and then it totally ignored Moon Crash. Yeah. So all three of us did the exact same thing that I feel mm. like a lot of people are doing. And if you're still listening to this through the spoiler section for some reason, if you haven't played, um, thank you. That means you enjoy listening to us talk. But play this. It's great. Uh, like in some ways more fun than the main game um the story in the main game i think puts it over the top of this but i had a blast uh playing this it was pretty good i don't think it's a 10 out of 10 by any means like uh -huh. i've heard people say that it is the definitive prey experience like it's better than the main game it's a masterpiece yada 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 and i'm like no to me it's just really good i enjoyed it yep i agree yeah i would say that some moments like putting together that final run kind of did feel like a definitive final test of like do i understand everything about prey yeah um but the main game is is a really special game i think it's it's really good um and so this is uh just different it's different in a lot of ways but yeah really good thank you guys so much for coming on the show this has been awesome um we have navigated time zones we've navigated people getting sick we've navigated flooded apartments to make this uh episode happen uh, i really appreciate you guys thanks for coming on oh it's good to finally be on here looking at your beautiful face <laughs> it's a shame your hair isn't long <laughs> yes uh yeah i have uh i've let everybody I'm down I'm, yeah i apologize your long-haired voice does not match your short-haired head <laughs> it was not my intention to mislead everybody with the um the length of my hair and the way my voice sounds. I'm very sorry. You're forgiven. But I'm trying to put on my uh, my uh, apologetic press conference voice right now. <laughs> I thought you were going to say, I'm trying to put on my short-haired voice right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> but no, thank you for having us. It's been a pleasure and it's good to finally uh, chat to you about fucking video games. Yeah. Kieran, be, be thankful. Thank Dave. 
Is he gone again? Oh, no. <laughs> he dipped out right at the end. All right, hang on. I'll. <clears throat> this is Kieran. Oh, you. Yeah, oh, no. <laughs> that's New Zealand. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're yes, jolly good. No, that's still New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> put on your bold, put on your bold voice. <laughs> uh, no, I can't do British right now. Anyway, <laughs> it, it's too late for British. It's too early for British over here. <laughs> I'll, uh, I echo everything Adam said. It's been a delight to uh, finally be on the uh, on the podcast, and very cool to be talking about such a good game as well. Um, so yeah, thank you very yeah. much for having us on. Yeah, for sure, and. Uh, if we can navigate the time zones again, I'd love to talk to you guys uh, on your show um, about something. Absolutely. Good times. Uh, sure. Looking forward to the next time we all get together. For yeah. sure. Yeah, me too. All right. So thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, one more plug to check out The Good, The Bad, and The Backlog. And uh, stay tuned next week for the next game that comes out of the backlog. <laughs> A lot of backlog talk here. <laughs> See you later, everybody. Bye. Bye. It's